Friday surprise. Welcome. Hey, everybody. Um, welcome to the State Department. Uh, it is indeed a Friday, uh, which is all things considered a good thing. Um, before I start, I do want to give a shout out uh, to someone who is leaving us today, uh, who has uh, served a short time in the front office, and we didn't drive him away, I can guarantee you, but he's going back to the Motor City, to Detroit, uh, and his family there. Uh, but Patrick Thelen, uh, thanks so much for uh, all you've done. Uh, and despite everything, he remains a, uh, a Detroit Lions fan, and God bless him for that. <laughs> but we wish him all the best. He's a great guy. Uh, I don't have anything at the top, uh, so I will go right to your questions. Again, two days in a row with nothing at the top. <laughs> Interesting. You've exhausted us. You've exhausted yeah. us. Yeah, they. Well, so let's uh, let's start with uh, let's start with um, Syria. Sure thing. I'm sure you're surprised. Yeah. It's now been two days since the secretary, in a phone call with Foreign Minister Lavrov, told the told the Russia that. You would uh, suspend a bilateral engagement unless Russia takes immediate steps to end the assault on Aleppo and return, <clears throat> restore the cessation of hostilities. Um, neither of those things have happened yet. Have, that, 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 that's correct? That's correct. All right. Um, so have you um, followed through then? I, I know that they talked again. Uh, they did speak earlier today, um, uh, actually, when the uh, secretary was en route back to, from uh, Israel. Um, and uh, we are at the same place. We have not definitively closed uh, that door. We have not definitively um, suspended our diplomatic uh, relations regarding Syria with Russia. Um, we're on the verge uh, because we have not yet seen uh, them take the kind of actions that we're looking to see them take, um, but we're not there yet. Um, and, you know, the conversation continues. Um, but you know where we stand on this. Uh, I, I know that uh, Russians, as uh, Arshad noted, have also been uh, speaking to the media. But uh, I, I think, you know, uh, the Secretary uh, has invested, uh, as we all know here, um, a great amount of effort in a diplomatic process. Um, there are other options that we've talked about here. Uh, many of them are not very good. Um, so before we definitively slam the door here, um, we want to make sure that uh, we understand uh, the stakes and that Russia understands the stakes, more importantly. Uh, so that's well, it. Well, you say that you, your position is clear, but <clears throat> I thought your position was clear two days ago that you were going to suspend this dialogue unless immediate action was taken. And it's now been 48 hours and there hasn't been any action. So I guess I, I, I my I, – yeah. I don't know how you can say your position is clear because it seems to be unclear, not and not just to me, but presumably also to the to the Russians. You, you you made this threat, they didn't do what you wanted them to do, and now you're not following through on it. Well, um, and I certainly don't want to uh, get into uh, or uh, divulge uh, the content of our diplomatic discussions, but these are conversations on the phone, okay. and so. I, I can't say right. what the Russians may be offering to do or steps they may take or not take. Again, we're just not there at work. Are, are you suggesting, are you saying that, not suggesting, are yeah. you saying that there is some sign, some indication from Russia that hope is not lost, that, that, that they're willing to do something tangible in response to this ultimatum that was, seems to be a non-ultimatum that was delivered? Well, um, again, I, I, I'll leave it more or less what I just said, which is that we continue to have conversations with Russia um, with uh, between Secretary uh, Kerry and, and Foreign Minister Lavrov, and they have that in insofar as we've not uh, reached the point where we believe there's no well, uh, reason to continue. I, I get that, but the Secretary himself and others yeah. um, – in this context and in the context of other negotiations or sure. has said that there's no point in having talks Agreed. for the sake of talks. And that and has not changed. It, so I'm it saying hasn't? Well, what are you, what are you, what I, I just don't want to get into details of, of, of what, but I, I, I would say that we're not there yet. We may be 
in a matter of hours, in a matter of days at that point, but we're not there yet. I, I, I don't know how to say it any more clearly than that. Well, or any less clearly. Well, I, yesterday sure. Sorry, I'm not. No, I'm done. Yesterday the Secretary said something to the effect that um, uh, we don't want, we want to be pulling back from the process so that we're not seen as complicit, I don't think he used the word complicit, but something like that, um, in empowering the Russians to do what they're doing. I mean, isn't that what is happening? I mean, they're continuing to do what they're doing. Well, they are. And I, I think so a couple of, of points to make there is one is that, uh, you know, um, we're not blind to what is happening. And Secretary Kerry has uh, clearly acknowledged that we're outraged uh, and uh, by what's taking place right now uh, with regard to Aleppo. Aleppo. Um, and as he said many times, it's egregious, it's horrific, it's in clear violation of international standards or norms, humanitarian norms and international law. And I think that at a certain point, when you look at that, uh, as we've been back and forth here on, it becomes uh, 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 futile to continue to believe in a diplomatic process. That said, I just can't definitively say we're there at that point yet. We're very close, but we're not there yet. Please. Just a few minutes ago, yep. that, um, that it's hard to continue to believe in a diplomatic process. So, if it's hard, why are you still? Why do you still believe in a diplomatic process? Well, uh, so first of all, um, Secretary Kerry is, in a sense, duty bound to uh, pursue the diplomatic process to the fullest extent that he, uh, that's possible. Uh, and we have not reached that threshold yet. Uh, again, I don't want to get into the conversations that are still ongoing, but uh, we've seen enough that we don't want to definitively close the door yet. Now, that, as I said, that may change uh, in the next, in the coming hours or days. Uh, I, I just don't have a, a, a clear uh, a time frame or time. You, you've seen enough from Russia. Uh, and that's who you're, we obviously you're waiting haven't, on haven't here. Closed the, closed the window, the door, whatever the metaphor you want to use uh, here. Um, but you've seen but, enough but, from whom or from, from where because... Oh, I, I would say that we've seen enough that, oh, I can't remember now what I just said, but <laughs> um, that there's enough there that we don't want to um, walk away yet. From the talks with Russia. Right. But what's also uh, another uh, factor as we look at this is, you know, if we do walk away from this diplomatic process as, you know, frankly moribund as it is, um, what are the options? And the, the Secretary has spoken about this. Um, you know, many of them are not good options. Um, we're continuing to have those conversations within the interagency, continuing to evaluate what we can do to alleviate the suffering uh, in Syria. But, you know, what, the last thing we want to see, obviously, is any kind of escalation if we, if we do pronounce a diplomatic process uh, 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 dead. Uh, then what we don't want to see is um, is an escalation into violence, and that could very well be the result. Hey, why did you make this threat if you don't seem willing to carry it out? That, doesn't that... Well, I, I don't want to... Again, we would not make such a, a, a statement if we weren't willing to carry it out. Um, and I also think that it, it is... You know, we've talked about this before in other negotiations, that at some point you've got to be able to say, if this is in no one's interest to continue this conversation, this dialogue, then it behooves us to walk away from it. But I think, you know, um, I agree, this is on life support, but it's not flatlined yet. Okay, at the moment, the Syrian army still... I don't know, I'm trying to... Where have we, when has the administration actually carried out a threat to walk away? Carried out a, a, a well. I mean, it came. Yeah, you didn't walk it. You, the U.S. didn't walk out of the Iran nuclear talks. We didn't, but we came close on several occasions. As yeah, you but, know. But, but, but you didn't do it, and um, and and you could argue, or I'm sure you, as you probably do, that <clears throat> you got what you say is a successful deal out of it by not walking away. But in, in terms of Syria, the administration has twice said that it would do things if such and such happened. Or didn't happen, and now uh, you know you know what I'm talking about. Sure. And 
and, and you didn't follow through. So I guess why do you why should the why should the Russians or anyone else for that matter take take it seriously? Well, again, I you know I can't speak to whether they do or do don't take us seriously, but they should. Um, you know because uh, we are reaching uh, that point. Well, if you break off, Please, sir, yeah. yeah, if you break off the talks tomorrow, say, or yeah. two days' time, because it's not going anywhere, and then the Slavrov calls you 24 hours later and says, oh, you were serious about that. Well, let's get the talks back <laughs> on again, then. Uh, I, again, that's a... It's a hypothetical. It's a hypothetical. But your, yeah. your threat is hypothetical. For it's a moment, hypothetical. So. Um, it's your statement, uh, I would, you know, with the caveat that, you know, at a certain point, it... it it becomes uh, very difficult to uh, believe uh, that Russia is serious or uh, possibly worse has any influence to dissuade uh, the regime from continuing to carry out strikes. But uh, I, I think if, you know, at, at any point in time, we're going to, uh, if we believe that, you know, there's a possibility for peace and a peaceful settlement of this, uh, again, it would be. Uh, 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 it'd be bad if we didn't pursue. <clears throat> so you, you'd pursue. call off the talks if there's no sign of the possibility of progress towards peaceful settlement. But if you call off the talks and then they ring you up and give you a sign, then you put them on again. Again, so I, I, I don't want to predict changes. I, I, no, I mean I don't want to predict. I mean, what I think we would, what I would say is what we're talking about here is the end of this. Uh, so-called Geneva Agreement, but this process that was reached, or this agreement rather, that was reached on September 10th, uh, after many months of, as you guys know, consultation and, and <coughs> close work, and the promise that that held uh, in many respects, including uh, the possibility of some joint implementation center, all of that I think would be So for the shunned. past three days, you've had daily phone calls with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov, and for the past three days, the Syrian army has made tactical advances around Aleppo. Will you be surprised if the day the Russian and Syrian forces get bogged down around Aleppo, then you get a more positive phone call? Well, um, and perhaps that would mean that, you know, the regime and the Russians come to the conclusion that we've come to. Uh, long ago, which is that there will be no military solution to uh, If they the seize Aleppo Syria. and then declare a ceasefire, would that be acceptable to you? Again, I don't want to, I'm, I'm not going to engage in hypotheticals. Okay, Please, Barbara. Uh, yeah, just a few questions, because yeah. Mr. Navarro has done an interview with the BBC and I wanted to get That's to right, the he did. Yes, he did. Um, so he denied using banned weapons in Syria and he denied targeting civilians. He said there wasn't evidence for that. And your response, first of all, but also does that does that kind of statement mean that you have any wiggle room left with these kinds of discussions you're having? Uh, you're, so, uh, I mean, look, we have seen uh, the regime uh, aided and abetted by uh, Russian uh, air power uh, carry out strikes against civilian targets. Um, they may argue that they're going after Nusra and these are collateral damage. Um, to a certain extent, that may be true, um, but there's a way to do it, do these kinds of strikes that limit that. But I think we've also just seen uh, evidence of uh, attacks on <coughs> civilian infrastructure and obviously on civilians that uh, are inexplicable uh, in terms of trying to go after Nusra. Uh, in terms of where that leaves us, I think, you know, as I said, it's uh, <coughs> it's difficult uh, to continue to pursue uh, a, a diplomatic process in the midst of so much carnage um, and so much evidence to the contrary. But, um, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're looking for <coughs> some kind of, let's say, against extraordinary action or extraordinary measures to, that at least give some sign that uh, Russia and or the regime are, are in any way interested in a, a, a credible cessation. And he's also, and he said this before, but he kind of spelled it out quite strongly in this interview, that the Russians are saying there's more and more evidence to believe <coughs> that the U.S. from the very start planned to protect al-Nusra as a kind of plan B against Assad. Um, Honestly, I've, I saw those remarks. Uh, it left me shaking my head. I, I don't know what he means by it. Well, I 
can conjecture what he means by it, but it's absurd. But do you think the, the fact that the U.S. hasn't been able to separate the opposition from Nusra, which is what the Russians keep saying, how, how much of a factor is that in the escalation? I mean, so granted up to the September 10th agreement in Geneva, we talked a lot about that commingling or whatever we, you know, marbleization, whatever the term is. Um, and it was a reality. We conceded that. Uh, and it was our challenge coming to the table, agreeing in Geneva. Our challenge was to try as best we can to reach out to the mod, uh, moderate opposition <coughs> and make clear to them that they needed to uh, in order for this thing to work. And we did that. Uh, we did it with our special envoy, Michael Ratney, but we did it through uh, the, also the other members of the ISSG, uh, other membering, uh, member governments, to reach out to the groups that they had contacts with to sell the deal, if, you could, if, you, if I could put it that way, to convince these groups that it was in their best interest to, uh, uh, to abide by it. Um, did we, you know, was we, were we 100 percent effective? No. But were we effective? Yes. And there was uh, uh, several days of uh, significant <laughs> reduction in violence. But what's happened now, uh, you know, with the hitting of the humanitarian convoy and with the subsequent siege on Aleppo, you know, you've got a scenario now, a dynamic where, you know, as these moderate opposition forces are under, you know, real and increasing pressure by the regime, that they're driven more or less into the arms. They have to turn to Nusra, fight side by side. It, so it just, it escalates and makes more confusing and more jumbled what is already a, a, a difficult situation. Was that, can I just ask one more question? Please. Yeah. Be very brief. Yeah. Okay. Just before I get, um, I, you talk about how you don't want to close and slam the door shut right now. Why, in your estimation, would it be so difficult to reopen that door uh, sure. and, and follow through on the threat and then to, to stop it and then see if that changes the situation? Why, why, why are you afraid, I guess, for lack of a yeah. word, that the door would be so hard to reopen? It's, it's a fair question. Um, I, I think what we're, uh, you know, um, and, and I tried to explain this, you know, what we're talking about, what was reached in Geneva, it's not to say that it would be impossible to somehow recreate that in some fashion, but I think a couple of things is, one is we'd set that aside for now and just say, look, that did not work, that was a failed effort. Um, and then two, um, you know, we would consider uh, as we, if Russia did come back to us in a week or 10 days or two weeks, um, it would factor into our uh, consideration uh, um, the fact that uh, they failed so miserably to live up to any kind of uh, deal that an agreement that we reached. Um, so again, it's a matter of credibility. Okay. Please, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I just, of course. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. That's okay. Can you work with people who are the opposition and the other side and fighters are fighting side by side with fighters that you support? Can you then work with the fighters that you support, or have they then become people who are providing it's material, material support yeah. to terrorists, and therefore that, you that's can't? A fair, sure, I'm sorry, I'm in help. Yeah. I think that was part of, you know, that was, so the, part, you know, one of the big pieces of this effort, apologize, um, some water, um, one of the big pieces of this effort coming out of Geneva was to attempt to do that, was to say, look, guys, we'll have a seven-day period of, you know, of, uh, cessation of, of violence or a significant reduction in the level of violence. And at that point in time, after seven days, uh, the regime would ground its air forces. We would set up this JIC, uh, Joint Implementation Center. And at that point, you're either with us or against us. Moderate op I'm talking about the moderate opposition. That would have been a clear line in the sand, if you will, or whatever, uh, that they were either with, still with Nusra or not. It, it, again, we talked about this. It's self-identifying, but it's also, it would have been a clear starting point from that point on to say, okay, you've made your choice, I guess. Just, and Barbara, one other one, if I may. Just yes, on, um, in that interview with the BBC, um, Foreign Secretary, Foreign Minister Lavrov said what, what the Russians have been saying for a number of days now, which is that accusing the United States of having failed to uh, disentangle the Nusra from the opposition that you support. Is it your view that the U.S. government was obliged immediately upon declaration or 
uh, or implementation of the ceasefire on September the 20th, on September the 12th, that it was your immediate obligation to begin disentangling the two? Or rather, is it your view that that was a process that was going to start after a week of uh, a ceasefire? Yeah. Um, so what I think was um, was understood was while we wouldn't from 1201, whatever it was on the Eid, that that seven-day period began, expect any kind of like, all right, guys, we're moving over to this section and we're disentangling ourselves, that over the course of that week, if we had gotten there. And we talked about that a lot is, is you know, it, during those initial days is that we didn't expect a clean break. We never did. I don't think anybody did. I don't think the Russians, the regime, but that we would work towards that uh, over the course of a period of time, seven days or whatever, um, to expect to see that. Once we felt that we were at that point, um, to the best of uh, an agreed upon of, uh, ability to reach that point, then we would say, okay, we're ready to move on to the next phase. At that point, as I said, then it's the, the moderate opposition who are integrated with uh, El Nusra would have had a choice to make. So in other words, it, it, are they making so, a fair uh, point here, yeah. the Russians, that they say you failed to do the No, because there wasn't like enough time. I mean, we did not have enough time to fully – sorry, I'm going to talk no, about no, we did not have enough time to fully implement uh, uh, the agreement. Um, and I, uh, you know, I talked about this a short time ago, is what, what you had starting last weekend with the, uh, uh, you know, the barrage and the, and the, and the airstrikes on, uh, on Aleppo, you've just, again, driven the opposition back into the, you know, the, we've recreated what was there before, which is, you know, that doesn't make anything any easier when these uh, groups are under the gun, literally, uh, by the regime and by Russian airstrikes. Uh, you know, uh, you know, the enemy of my friend is my friend. You know, it's like, or, you know, or my, the, sorry, the uh, friend of my enemy is my, what is it, whatever the damn thing is. The enemy of my enemy, enemy is, is my, my friend. friend. Yeah, yeah, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so you're going to, you know, you're going to have a dynamic where, you know, you're driving them back into the arms of Nusra. And just to get back to my original question, can you continue to offer support to people that are fighting side by side with people you deem to be terrorists? I mean, if they're fighting with them, they're providing material support to them, right? So can you still provide assistance to the moderates, to the so-called moderates? So I want to talk about – and for various reasons, I don't want to necessarily get into details of who or among the moderate opposition we may be providing assistance to. Um, I, I think that that's all under consideration that when we look at who we might provide assistance to among the moderate opposition, we're constantly looking at But, but as a matter the, of law, the, can you do that? I, I, mean, I don't think we can. Uh, and, but I also think that we look in, in, and, and look at a number of factors uh, when we uh, evaluate or look at how we uh, provide assistance to these groups. Uh, that's one of them, clearly, uh, but other is their behavior, um, you know, whether they're, uh, you know, uh, 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 guilty of committing human rights abuses or anything like that. Just a final question. Again, with regards to the Russian suspicions, um, you haven't really gone after Nusra that much. Have you been Have you been holding back on going after Nusra because they were – Mixed with the opposition? I mean, all we hear about is the strikes on ISIS. Yeah. We don't hear so, about strikes on Nusra. Uh, so uh, – uh, Sorry, let me – the second question yeah. to you before uh, – the other one is um, you keep saying there's no military solution. That's what – so therefore you have to keep the diplomatic channel open. But we're not actually talking about a military solution, are we? We're talking about a credible threat of force to help a diplomatic solution. So uh, my second question would be is, is, is that under discussion? But anyway. Um, without lending one option any more importance or significance than any other option, I would say all options are under discussion uh, in answer to your second question. Uh, in answer to your first question, which was, again, about – We keep hearing about striking yeah. ISIS, but never oh, about striking uh, Nusra. You know, we did carry out strikes uh, initially back in 2014, 2015 against Nusra, but absolutely you're correct in that as they became intermingled and as they became um, – uh, intermingled in civilian areas, we've always sought to limit, uh, you know, the uh, possibility of civilian casualties uh, in any of our airstrikes. And again, one of the things I talked about a little bit about this week is, um, you know, what and what partly the, the promise that this Joint Implementation Center held was 
we wanted to work in a very strategic fashion about how to take out uh, senior Nusra leadership, like we've done pretty effectively against ISIL. Uh, and that doesn't include just, you know, laying waste to, uh, you know, populated areas that may be under Nusra's control. That's a very uh, uh, non-surgical way to do it. Can I just ask a follow-up? Of course. You, okay. you hit uh, Nusra, I believe you d described it as Al-Qaeda, maybe in Affiliate, March yeah. or something, or yeah. February. It was earlier this year. Yep. Since then, there hasn't been any specific uh, action against Nusra, is that right? Military action. No, but I'd have to double check. I just okay. can't definitively say that. And I think because of that, that right. space is, one, occupied by regime and Russian air air forces, but also because of the mix. Um, given that you, you, you've described the JIC as something that would be, uh, the Secretary has, it would be in U.S. interest anyways because you want to target Nusra. Yes. Why aren't you attacking Nusra anyhow if it's in That's US what I was interest? saying is, but I, and I'm sorry if I wasn't No, clear. no, no, I understand yeah. what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah, so okay. How would that change mm -hmm. by cooperating with Russia? You still wouldn't attack civilian population. No, but I, but we, we, what we, again, and I'm, you know, I would really encourage you to talk to uh, someone at the Pentagon uh, who can give you a much more detailed tactical view of this, but one of the um, premises behind this was that it would allow us to better share intelligence uh, and information and really target, as I said, senior leaders uh, among uh, Nusra and go after them in a much more strategic fashion rather than, frankly, using dumb bombs and, uh, and cluster bombs and, or cluster munitions and that kind of thing where we're just, again, uh, laying waste to an area versus going after a specific target or, or a group of individuals. If you had actionable yes. intelligence against Nusra senior leaders, as you describe them, uh, would, would you be we, able to target them today or not because Aleppo and Idlib and a lot of these areas yeah. are out of um, your, out of, you know, are they in the confliction zone? I would. I, I don't want to. Uh, so um, I would encourage you to talk to somebody okay. uh, from the Department of Defense whether we would be able to, through our deconfliction mechanism, be able to target them. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, Samir. Then is the U.S. providing the Syrian opposition? Is, any, is the U.S. providing no. the Syrian opposition any military help or any guidance to prevent the fall of East Aleppo to the Syrian and the Russians? Well, um, look, we, you know. Um, we do provide them uh, some support um, and some guidance. Uh, I don't want to get into details, uh, and I don't want to get into discussions of which groups uh, among the uh, moderate opposition that we support. But, but yes. You are providing? We do provide assistance. But did you increase it oh, recently? I'm sorry. Did we what? Did you increase it recently? I I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Please. Um, just quickly, I mean, what, to circle back to what we were talking about at the beginning, what more would Russia need to do for you to move from the verge to actually closing the door on them? I mean, how – Sure. it seems like it's gotten a lot worse in the last – Yes, it has. Week. I mean, that's – So yeah. what more um, would need to happen? Well, I think, again, to offer to, at the very least, uh, put in place or stop the siege. To, uh, no, I mean, what more would a, need to happen for you Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Away. Okay, I get where you're going now. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I mean – you know, it's hard for me to say that a particular action or another, uh, you know, uh, event uh, would push us over the edge. All I can say, Nick, is that we're very close. Because that, I mean, that then, the question. I think it's rather not uh, a question of, you know, I think it's a question that, it, you know, if the current pattern uh, continues any longer and we don't see any effort to in any way arrest that or stop that or, uh, improve that environment uh, or climate or whatever uh, in, around Aleppo, at some point we'll say, okay. So I'm does the, the fact that you haven't walked away, given the, given that it's gotten so much worse, can we read that as an indication that the U.S. and Russia are discussing something now that does provide hope that this thing can be salvaged? I wouldn't use hope. I think we it, it, that we haven't closed the door. That we're still, um, you know, there's still uh, some sense that uh, that there are steps that could be taken. But I I, I don't want to even uh, characterize it as hopeful. Yes, sir. Sorry, good. 
that Russia is moving more aircraft into Syria. Can you confirm that? I, I, I can't. Um, I, I saw the same report and looking to clarify or get confirmation of it, but I wasn't able to. Okay. Please, Lucas. Yeah. Um, how close is Aleppo to fall? Again, I'm, you know, um, uh, I, I don't want to predict. I don't want to, uh, I just don't have that kind of uh, clarity uh, and knowledge uh, at that level. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, we heard it here uh, just a little while ago that um, there appears to be um, um, forces massing uh, for some kind of uh, assault on Aleppo. Uh, we're watching it very closely, but it's hard to say. I mean, as you know, I mean, you know, watching conflict zones around the world, it's hard to say when and if a city uh, or population center could fall. Um, but, you know, given the uptick in violence, given the uh, 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 the intensity of it, it's, uh, it's hard, it's, uh, it could be soon. Does the United States have a moral obligation to help the citizens of Aleppo? Uh, that is a fair question to ask. Uh, I, I think that that is something that uh, we have sought to do uh, by pursuing so aggressively uh, this diplomatic process. Uh, I think we've also uh, sought to do so by uh, pursuing uh, and increasing, uh, even this past week, our humanitarian assistance to those who have been displaced by the fighting, but also those within Syria, and trying to continue to get them uh, some level or some measure of assistance despite the fighting. Um, you know, these are tough options. As I said, you know, and the Secretary has spoken about this, is there's no good options. And, you know, when you look at what are, what's possible, um, it means, and these are all things we have to weigh, greater military involvement on behalf of the U.S. Uh, and putting American lives at risk. And that's a, that's, so you have to weigh all of these things. And I, I agree, it's uh, as much of it, as much as it's a moral outrage, what's going on there, um, that all has to be weighed. So today, <laughs> today marks the one year anniversary of Russia's airstrikes in Syria. Uh, how would you characterize the last year in Syria with this these Russian strikes, and Russia's goal is to prop up the Assad regime, and it appears that their goal has been reached, as they've been successful. Uh, you're right. Uh, it, it is a, a grim anniversary uh, since uh, one year since the, they began uh, 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 supporting uh, the Assad regime in earnest with airstrikes. Um, you know, uh, uh, it is hard not to assess that they have succeeded in bolstering uh, the regime. Uh, and that, at least at the purely tactical level or the short term, uh, was uh, as a short term goal was clearly their intent. Uh, they've been clear about that. And, you know, one of their concerns was that if Assad fell, uh, if the government fell, that there would be chaos and that would, you know, allow terrorist groups to um, consolidate. Our argument has consistently been, uh, while recognizing that we don't want a vacuum, that there's a democratic or democratic, that there's a diplomatic way to get there. Ceasefire, parties negotiate, work out a plan. We don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. The government, certain government infrastructure remains, civilian uh, infrastructure remains. There's a way to get there without doing what they're doing right now. So if they've succeeded in propping up and creating some kind of stalemate, okay, so be it. Then we were able to put a cessation of hostilities in and then create that negotiating process. But it, it, it becomes increasingly evident that they may have broader or greater aims than that. I have a few questions on Iran, yeah. if you don't mind. Iran, sure. Are we yeah, done with? Oh, sure, of course. Of course. Uh, okay, if, great. Uh, if Eastern Aleppo does fall, is that a defeat for U.S. policy, given your response? Uh, to I think it's a defeat for, you know, the world in the sense that it's just going to create a greater hardship uh, for the Syrian people. It's going to create uh, more chaos within Syria and allow uh, what are clearly terrorist groups with, uh, like ISIL and Nusra with uh, aims to carry out terrorist attacks, not only within Syria, but uh, more broadly, uh, to consolidate and to strengthen. Uh, so it, it's a losing proposition no matter who you are. And in your response to questions earlier, you seem to be suggesting that the increased mixing between al-Nusra and, uh, and the other opposition groups was an unfortunate side effect of, uh, of Russia's uh, stance. Could it not be their goal? 
I, yeah, I mean, I, you know, that's, uh, that's one person's analysis. I can't, you know, it's several that people. Not, well, I mean, I just, I, I, several I, experts, but. I mean, that, that's something I'll have to ask the Russians. Um, whenever Plan B is mentioned, you say there's no good options and military options. You know, you don't see a military solution. How many sanctions has the U.S., has this administration put on Russia? As a result of a year of intervention that has killed, I don't well, know. Well, you're right. Our sanctions. Well, you say thousands yeah. of civilians. I mean, how, how many sanctions has the U.S. government? Yeah, I mean, uh, we have sanctions in place, but regarding their behavior and, uh, in and their actions in Ukraine. No, I, I was just about yeah. to say that. Um, you know, and I, another valid option, um, you know, one, that, one among many that we're looking at. Um, but I, I don't know anything particularly to announce. Why, why in, in 2012, maybe even at the end of 2011, the U.S. Uh, applied sanctions on various Iranian entities mm -hmm. for supporting Syria, mm -hmm. uh, given that Russia's involvement has taken on a level, uh, at least through air power, that mm -hmm. far outstrips Iran. What made the Iranian uh, support so heinous? And the deaths they caused that it prompted a sanctions response. sanctions response. And what makes the Russian one so blase or not so significant that it doesn't get a sanctions response from the US? Uh, so, um, um, with regarding with regard to sanctions, as I said, we do have already pretty severe sanctions again uh, directed at their behavior in in Ukraine. Um, in place against Russia. So whenever you're looking at whether to sanction more or to increase the pressure on uh, the Russian economy, you weigh a number of options. Um, sanctions can be very effective. We've seen it in the case of Iran, uh, especially with regard to the nuclear program. Um, but uh, we also want to weigh that with our ability to work effectively with Russia. So, um, so we just haven't reached that decision point yet. So it was the diplomatic track that remained open that kept sanctions out of play on Russia for all this death and destruction over the last um, several months? Uh, that was one element of it. But. And then, so what, if this, uh, if these, if this engagement ends, uh, what precludes the U.S. from then taking a sanctions response to Russia? Again, I'm, I'm not going to engage in uh, hypotheticals about what we may or may not do, except to say that uh, there's a number of options out there, and we'll continue to look at them all. Uh, they're all being discussed uh, and debated and considered, um, and sanctions are among them. Please. Questions on Bernard? Yeah, of course. Um, on the subject of uh, the Wall Street Journal story today, yeah. what impact did the analysts here at the State Department assess that the delisting of those two banks, which are so intimately tied to Iran's ballistic missile program, would have on Iran's development of ballistic missiles? So, um, first of all, the, the story you bring up, um, um, there's None of, uh, none of the facts of that uh, story were particularly new. Um, but uh, what I can say is that we did, when we were looking at, um, so we had agreed to delist um, or uh, remove the designation, rather, specially designated uh, nationals and blocked persons list, SDN list. We'd agreed to remove Bank SEPA from that list uh, on implementation day as part of the JCPOA. Now, um, as part of that process, we looked at all of the entities. Uh, we conducted a very thorough review, uh, in, in, in essence, updating uh, what we knew about Bank SEPA and, um, and whether they qualified. And it was our assessment that they did qualify. So, and is that because yeah. they were no longer tied to the ballistic missile program? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's exactly right, that, that they were no longer carrying out actions that we believed uh, were linked to or linked them to uh, the ballistic missile program. Now, um, uh, um, so, uh, and then, there, of course, there was the then subsequent delisting uh, by the UN. 
Um, but what's important also to remember in any of this, uh, whenever we're talking about delisting someone uh, from sanctions, that we always maintain the, the uh, ability uh, to reimpose uh, U.S. sanctions uh, on Bank SEPA or any other entity in Iran if we then uh, uh, consider their behavior is, uh, is, uh, is uh, or merits. And did uh, the Secretary Kerry believe that unshackling, unshackling the banks that have financed Iran's ballistic missile program will somehow slow down the program? That did Secretary Kerry believe that removing the sanctions against these banks, did he believe that would slow down Iran's nuclear ballistic missile program? Uh, not necessarily. I think this was part of, uh, again, some of the things we looked at in terms of um, you know, the determinations that we made as part of the JCPOA, uh, which entities needed to continue to be sanctioned. That's something we do all the time, but certainly within the, uh, the, the framework of the JCPOA, uh, we looked at. But we make uh, no excuses for uh, what was a very uh, considered determination uh, with regard to Bank SEPA's role in a ballistic program, but also that we uh, continue to have concerns about Iran's ballistic missile program. And uh, please, Chairman Royce and others on Capitol Hill have complained that the briefings to congressional staff only occur after decisions are being made, not beforehand. Why is the administration only briefing lawmakers after the fact? Uh, I don't have the specific timeline in front of me. I mean, I know that we made all the materials available to Congress uh, for their consideration. So we're After trying to. Or I, I don't know, uh, to be honest. Uh, I don't have that in front of me. Um, but uh, you know, uh, we certainly try to be responsive and work with Congress and make them aware of what we're, uh, what actions we're taking. Especially Are there with any other Iran. parts of this uh, nuclear agreement? Or we just don't know about. I mean, I, there's now that's three what I documents to, that are signed sure. by again. Mr. One Robert. of the reasons. Sorry, fourth document. So one of the so one, of the, re one of the reasons I, as I said that there's nothing particularly new in this story is that this was all came out and you know there's you know uh, there's even several articles written uh, at the time that it happened. Um, I think there was so much happening. Uh, <laughs> we've talked about that quite a bit in that uh, very. Uh, congested period of time around implementation day that I think elements were lost. Um, and, and, and there wasn't a recognition that uh, of all the pieces that were in play. Was the delisting the two banks, was that more leverage to use against Not the at all. Not at all. It was just a different, again, and we talked about this a lot, and that's what I say, the, the, that so much, whether it was the, de the, the detainees being released, uh, uh, whether it was the, the Hague settlement being paid, whether it was the delisting of, of this bank, there was a lot that happened in a very short time span. Was this but, the sweetener but were not to the linked. deal? Please. Was this the sweetener to the deal? Like not at very all. close no. to getting the prisoners released? And no. Um, again, what it, what, it, what it was, and we've said as much, is that we had a window, we had a moment, an opportunity to um, seal a number of different deals, if you will, to close a number of different uh, um, outstanding issues. Uh, with uh, with Iran, and we sought to do so. And last final question, Please, just go to go back to that first yeah. one. Was there any kind of internal assessment done that told the secretary and other top officials what delisting these banks would have on Iran's ballistic missile program? What, uh, and I, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure Please, I understand that. Did analysts here at the State Department study what kind of what would happen after the, this delisting occurred? Like, was there any kind of analytics done uh, to yes. say what impact delisting these banks would have on Iran's ballistic missile program? Yes, it was made, the determination was made after a careful review of the activity of all the individuals and entities, including uh, Bank Zeppa, uh, that would be removed from this uh, list, uh, uh, SDN list that I talked about, specially designated nationals and block persons list on implementation day. So this was not done in any way, shape, or form, haphazardly or by impulse. Uh, this was a part of a, uh, a very uh, uh, thorough review. Yeah. Please, sir. Yeah. So um, the Philippines. Yes. Uh, recently, Duterte uh, likened himself to Hitler and said that uh, he'd be happy to slaughter the, uh, the drug users and peddlers in his country. Um, has anyone from the State Department been in contact with the Philippines in regards to these comments? Um, I'm not aware. I don't know what our bilateral mission, if they've been in contact with the, the, the Philippine government. Um, you, you've seen a number of uh, 
not the U.S. government, but a number of uh, voices uh, comment on <laughs> on the President Duterte's remark remarks. Uh, look, you know, what I would say to that is that America's relationship or partnership uh, with the Philippines uh, is long, uh, and it's been based on uh, a mutual uh, foundation of shared values, um, and that includes our shared belief in uh, human rights and human dignity. And uh, within that context, President Duterte's comments uh, are a significant departure uh, from that tradition, and we find them troubling. So. It so obviously he's had some couple other spats, yes, especially with Obama and such. How, how much longer is the State Department going to let him go on these kind of like off the wall comments? Uh, you know, uh, as I said previously, uh, words matter, especially when they're from uh, leaders of uh, sovereign nations, uh, especially sovereign nations with whom we have a long uh, and, as I said, valued. Uh, relations uh, with. Um, but what I've also been clear about is uh, from a government-to-government -government level or at a government-to-government -government level, we continue uh, to productively, constructively, closely cooperate uh, with the Philippines on a number of issues. Uh, and our people-to-people -people ties remain strong. Our security and military ties uh, remain strong. Uh, our economic ties remain strong. And so you know, while there is this, um, you know, there's a, these remarks uh, uh, occasionally being made, um, at the working level, uh, our relationship remains uh, very strong and very vital. So you see no hindrance about these kind of, like, there's, no, no, there's no hindrance with the relationship after this? Not time. that we've seen, no. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. On, on that, the security forces are acting on, on this kind of rhetoric. I mean, there have been reports of killings. And is there a point where you can't work with I, the I understand those, security forces? No, I understand that, and where we've, you know, we have been deeply concerned about reports of extrajudicial uh, killings um, uh, by or at the behest of the uh, government authorities in the Philippines and have called on and uh, repeat our calls uh, for uh, thorough, transparent investigations into any credible report of extrajudicial killings. Mark, I just uh, quickly on that, I mean, he's, he's basically calling for the death of three million people. Your, your response uh, uh, doesn't really, I mean, you find it troubling. It seems more than troubling. Well, again, I, you know, um, um, I, I, I think that it's, you know, again, what I said before was that uh, when we listen to these kinds of uh, comments, uh, it is uh, concerning, uh, especially by the from the leader of a, a, a nation. Uh, with whom we have such a long uh, and valued uh, relationship with, and one that is based on, uh, you know, uh, concern about human rights, uh, democracy, uh, all the values uh, that we hold dear, uh, and uh, I'll leave it there. Is, is there any concern that if you criticize him too strongly, despite these outrageous actions and comments, that you'd be driving him towards uh, strong relations with China and Russia, which he has expressed interest in. And I'm aware of those remarks, and we've been very clear. Uh, Secretary Kerry's been very clear when he met with uh, President Duterte. Um, we're not – this is not a zero-sum game for us. Um, you know, we're not trying to dictate uh, with whom uh, the Philippines should have uh, stronger relations with. Our only concern is that we want to maintain our strong relationship with the Philippines. Um, but, again, I'll stress that it has to be one that's based on shared values, uh, democratic values, uh, respect for human rights, and, uh, you know, words matter. I'll say it again. So you don't think that you're pulling any punches in his criticism – in criticizing him? I'll leave it where I left it. What? Uh, oh, sure. I'm sorry. And then uh, and you in the back. You did No, but for – I was looked at her, and then I promise I'll get to you. Uh, so yes. Republican presidential candidate. Donald Trump suggested that former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton fast-tracked the citizenship of former Miss Universe Alicia Machado. Is that something that um, you think would be possible for her to have done either in her capacity as Secretary of State or after as a former Secretary? Um, so 
the naturalization process, uh, as you probably know, is handled by uh, uh, the U.S. Citizenship uh, and Immigration Services. Uh, so for any questions about any individual case like that, I'd have to refer you to them. Please. Oh, you, you know, oh, I'm sorry. so sorry. Okay. No, I, okay. I apologize. Okay. So you refer the questions to them, but you, you if, do you, do you reject the statement that, that the Secretary of State interfered with the immigration process in this case, or are you just saying you have no comment on that? I have no comment other than that, you know, it's, it, it, we have no reason to believe in the veracity of that statement. Thank you. Please. Uh, have, have you got any assurance from either India or Pakistan regarding the situation on the line of control about what future course of action uh, each of them might take? Do we have any, I apologize, any clarity, you said? Yeah, any assurance from either India or Pakistan on what future action they might plan on the LOC? Um, well, I think uh, uh, John or Kirby, John Kirby spoke a little bit about this. Uh, you know, we're continuing to follow the situation on the ground very closely. Um, from our perspective, we urge calm and restraint by both sides. Um, we understand that the Pakistani and Indian militaries have been in communication, uh, and we believe that uh, continued communication between them is uh, important to reduce tensions. I think we don't certainly don't want to see any kind of escalation, uh, and any and certainly any kind of break in that communication. Uh, we have uh, repeatedly and consistently expressed our concerns regarding the danger that cross-border terrorism poses for uh, the region, and that certainly includes uh, the recent uh, attacks, uh, terrorist attacks in Uri. Um, and we continue to urge actions to combat and de-escalate and delegitimize, rather, uh, terrorist groups like lakshar e uh, uh, Taiba, rather, uh, Haqqani Network, as well as jaish uh, e Muhammad. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's on the there. same. I just have some few clarification. Okay. Uh, did you have any pre-knowledge of this so-called Indian surgical strike on Pakistani soil? No, no, I don't have anything for you on that. Sorry. And um, it was, it's all based on an Indian statement that this happened, and the Pakistan says it didn't happen, and then it says two killed, and they have arrested us. Uh, so so wh what, what, on what basis are you, you know, uh, reacting on the basis of the statement from India, on a basis of, uh, do you have, I know you I mean, don't talk have, about the intelligence I mean, matters. we have high-level engagement, as you can imagine, with both governments, and yeah. uh, our assessment is based on that. So you confirm it happened? It's not for me to confirm it happened. It's for the governments themselves to uh, speak to their roles. Okay, and then there was a uh, calls between uh, Secretary Kerry and the uh, Indian F External Affairs Minister, Sushma Swaraj. There was. Uh, and a few days ago. What, yeah, what was, uh, was the, the, there a suggestion from uh, Secretary to Indian Minister to cool down the, you know, the, the whatever was going on at the UNGA and, and take it easy before this happened? Um, I, I'll have to see if I can uh, get you a, a readout of that uh, that call. Um, but again, it's part of our, you know, we're very concerned about the situation there. We don't want to see it escalate any further. Um, and uh, as part of that uh, concern, uh, you know, Secretary is certainly engaged in talking to uh, 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 Indian leadership, senior Indian leadership. Just the last one. Just the last one. Uh, the Pakistan has uh, reacted saying that if India does it again, they will react. And then they also talked about uh, uh, using nukes. Like they don't have a uh, no first use policy like India has declared a no first use. So do you, ex uh, according to, you know, as you have the high le level connect connections and uh, the intelligence reports, which you do not talk from the podium, right. uh, do you but expect uh, further uh, trouble? I mean, in terms, uh, so just to answer your question about some of the uh, rhetoric from the Pakistani government and the possibility of uh, using nukes or nuclear weapons, um, I would just say nuclear-capable states have a very clear responsibility uh, to exercise restraint uh, regarding nuclear weapons and, and missile capabilities. And uh, that's my message publicly, and that's certainly our message uh, directly to the Pakistani authorities. So after you were caught for restraint and calm, 
the signals that you get from India and Pakistan, are they reassuring for you? Uh, I don't have a real readout. I mean, I think we're just still following the situation on the ground very closely. Please. Yeah, today, New York Times published an article based on a leaked audio of Secretary Clinton's fundraiser in which she uh, heard as saying, expressing concerns about the security of Pakistani nuclear weapons, and she also talks about a nuclear suicide bomber kind of thing. Uh, do you agree with her assessment? Uh, do you have concerns about Pakistan's nuclear security? Well, I, I think I just uh, uh, attempted to speak to, to that concern about uh, uh, some of the rhetoric, as I said, we've seen coming out of Pakistan regarding its nuclear uh, uh, weapons or in, um, uh, with regard to I, I haven't seen her remarks, I, honestly. I just haven't seen them, so I can't speak to them. Sorry. The, uh, the rhetoric or the statement has come from none, uh, none other than the defense minister himself. And in this month, twice in interviews, he has said right. I, I, use, he, he had I don't threatened mean to talk to over use. you, but I just said, uh, obviously, we believe that uh, nuclear capable states um, have a very uh, uh, clear responsibility uh, to use nuclear weapons uh, responsibly. To well, to not use them, exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, but also to refrain from rhetoric. To, did I just say use it? <laughs> use them responsibly. Okay. Well, this is what happens when you keep me up here for you know 90 plus minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, to not use uh, nuclear weapons. And with that, I'm going to cut you all off. I have one more. Um, uh, Bahrain, uh, yep. Nabi Rajab, uh, I think he has a court uh, date next week. Uh, what does the U.S. expect, and will any American officials be present? Uh, um, Bahrain. Sorry. Yeah, Bahrain. So, sorry, of course. Um, well, you know our concerns. We've been uh, quite vocal about uh, this individual and his case. Um, I can't say that we'll, uh, whether we'll be actually in attendance, but I could imagine we will. Uh, certainly, we're following the trial closely. What was your last? What was the other part of the? Uh, what What you expect? Uh, what you expect in this hearing? Do you expect uh, due process to be with? I mean, yeah, you, I mean, you of course, we want to expect see, him to be released. Given I mean, that you don't think the charges are precisely, under and and that we've said that before. Um, but uh, you know, we certainly, at the very least, want to see a transparent uh, uh, trial for him. Similar case, different side of the girl. Yes, Mohammadi, uh, the Iranian women's rights activist, right. uh, appeal court confirmed a 16-year sentence. Uh, Your yes. views. Share them shortly. I know that my views are in here somewhere. <laughs> I know, but I really want to get the, the I really want to get the the flavor of it for you. No, just one second. I apologize. Ah. Um, we're uh, deeply troubled by reports that Iranian courts have upheld the 16-year prison sentence of Iranian journalist and human rights defender Narjis uh, Mohammadi. Uh, no one should be jailed for peaceful civic activism. Uh, we are further concerned about reports that Mohammadi's health is rapidly deteriorating while in prison and that she's been cut off from communicating with her two young children. Given these circumstances, uh, the imposition of this prison, prison sentence is particularly harsh and unjustified. Uh, and we call on the government of Iran uh, to provide Mohammadi with adequate med medical care and to release her on humanitarian grounds. Just one more on the line. Is there anything more that needs to come out about implementation day? Are there any other documents or news? I thought I answered this. No, uh, I mean, look, uh, you know, again, we understand that a lot happened in a very condensed time period. Um, we tried to be as forthcoming during that time period about all the different elements that came together, um, understand the level of interest in this historic agreement, but uh, we I can't say that there's anything new or more to come out on, on what we agreed on. And finally, are Aleppo's days numbered? Again, I think that, um, you know, I spoke about this before. I'm, I'm not a military tactician. Um, I, I think that uh, Aleppo is um, – under tremendous pressure. Uh, we're watching it closely. Um, what we really want to see there is uh, an end to this uh, uh, inhumane uh, besiegement of the city. Please. 
Do you have anything on the any update on the U.S. citizens who were reportedly who reportedly died in the Seychelles? Ah, uh, yes. Um, uh, hold on. I'm not sure I have much to offer, um, but I know this is. Apologize. One second. Uh, so, uh, uh, as you know, uh, the, there were the deaths of two U.S. citizens in the Seychelles last week. It uh, goes without saying that we extend our deepest condolences to the family and friends of these individuals, and they're certainly uh, in the course or in the process of providing all appropriate consular assistance. Um, for questions about, which is I think where you're going with this, uh, about the circumstances of their deaths and the investigation into the, their deaths, uh, I'd have to refer you to local authorities. And out of respect for the family during uh, uh, what is clearly a difficult time, uh, I don't have anything else to add. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, guys. Thank you.